Have mercy on me, O God. Psalms 51, I'm sorry, fellas. Didn't give them any notes either. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and my, in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And then go down to verse 10. He says, create in me a clean heart. Create there uh, comes from the word uh, in the Hebrew that simply means to make something out of nothing. Now, we, can't, we can act and we can be artistic, but we cannot create. Create means to make something out of nothing. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And verse 12 says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold with the, with." Thy free spirit. Father, for the next few minutes, you know our heart. I ask you, God, that you would clear our mind, Lord, of anything. Help us to, Lord, just what you've told us in the last few minutes, help us to convey that. Let there be no barrier between speaker and hearer. And I pray, God, that you'd forgive me for all ever sin in my life. If there's something, Lord, that I'm not aware of, would you shine your spotlight on me? In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. you may be seated. If you're a Bible scholar, or if you're not, this Psalm 51 is called uh, a repentance or penance psalm. Uh, David, um, th this psalm was written after his affair with Bathsheba. Now, the interesting thing about David is, and it's kind of the way life is, you can live a perfect life and mess up one time and people don't forget it. Can I get a good amen right there? And so David's life, if you put it across here in a white sheet as pure as linen as you could get, there would be one little black spot on it, and that is the black spot of Bathsheba, and it was critical to what happened after that uh, and, and, and how he reaped and sowed from what happened. David and Bathsheba is a uh, just a really... Uh, a, 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 a case of human failure and frailty. But, you know, I, when I first started Bible college, they told us something. Here's what they told us when we went in. The Bible is not a book that man would write if he could or could write if he would. The Bible is not a book that a man would write if he could or could write if he would. Let me, let me explain that, expound upon that. The, the, the thing is, if I was writing the Bible, I'd leave this story out. If I was going to do a family history, I'd just leave out how Solomon, I'd say David married Bathsheba. Isn't that the coolest thing since sliced bread? But God gives us the nitty gritty. As one, one time Abraham Lincoln was being painted and the guy painted him without that wart on his nose. And he said, where's my wart? He said, I thought you'd look more presidential without it. And of course, you know, we now have the guy that's the most presidential in the history of, of presidents. If you don't believe that's what he said yesterday. But anyway, he said, I want wart and all. And so, well, I lost half the crowd then. The Republicans all got mad. But anyway, uh, he said, I want ward and all. Well, that's kind of how the Bible is. It gives you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Why does he do that? Because he knows Mike Smith's not perfect. Because he knows Donnie Humphrey's not perfect. And he knows it's not a question of if we'll sin. It's when and are we sorry for it. And do we repent? And thus we get to the 51st Psalm. Uh, it's a beautiful, if, if you look at there, oh my goodness, you could spend a week in there studying all the little intricacies and, and, and the doctrinal truths and the, and the shadows and type that's in there, but we don't have time for that. So for the next 25, 30 minutes, I'd like the best I could to talk to you about the doctrine of repentance. Repentance, when I was a young boy in church, repentance was something preachers beat you over the head with. You know, I don't drink, smoke, or chew, and don't hang around boys and girls who do, and neither should you. I mean, you, you hear that over and over. All you heard is, don't do this, don't do that. This is incorrect, don't do that. And it was full of legalism. Can I get amen for all you who's been around a while? But, but repentance is the greatest doctrine that we've ever seen because without it, we are separated from God. The Bible said there's a chasm, there's a giant gulf between us and God. Holy, righteous God, unrighteous man needs a bridge, and that bridge is the cross of Jesus Christ. And we get that forgiveness by simply repenting. Repenting in the Old Testament means to go back home. That's a Hebrew word for it. In Greek, it means uh, to change direction. Let me explain to you. You're going this way. You're doing wrong. You're getting worse. You're getting worse. And God speaks to you. You stop and change direction. You see, repentance is more than being sorry. 
I remember when I was me and a bunch of boys out one night, and I was 17 year old, and we got to go to the Gray Bar Hotel. Any of y'all ever been to the Gray Bar Hotel? They give you the neatest little stainless steel bracelets to wear. They make you wear them behind your back. But uh, we ended up, when I got in there and they said, you got one telephone call, you got to call your daddy who was deacon, weighed 285 pounds, was about eight inches between the eyes. I was sorry. (laughs) I felt bad. But I didn't repent because it changed my behavior very little. I just got better at keeping my sin concealed. I got better not letting mom and dad and those people around me. But repentance is when we say not only I'm sorry, but God, I'm tired of the way I'm living. I'm tired of it. And you can be 4 or 40. You can be a, a, a junior high. You can be a college student. You can be a professor. You can be a pastor. Anything. But we all need the doctrine of repentance. Repentance is a tool that God gives us that we can have a constant communion with Him. In Psalms 66, the Bible said that God said that uh, in in, in Psalm 66, if you have iniquity, if you regard sin in your life, I can't hear your prayers. He didn't say what. He just can't. And you say, how is that possible? He's omniscient. That's how it's possible. He can do whatever he wants to do. Somebody said one time, one of my liberal guys told me, he said, do you really believe that Jesus walked on the water? I said, I certainly do. He said, that's against the laws of gravity. I said, he wrote them. So, you know, with faith, I don't have enough faith to believe some of this stuff that the world's teaching now. But I do have enough faith to believe that there's a holy God that loves us, gave his son for us. And today, your heartbeat picking up just a little bit, a little bit of sweat on your palms, a little bit of, that is the Holy Ghost telling you to listen up. God's got something for you. First verse, if you would, show me the very first verse of that, and we'll just do verse by verse. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. In other words, take them out of the book. Blot them out means simply to erase them. Or in those days, they, they just took another a dark or a ink or stain and covered up like when, when, when you were a sponge for a crime or something. They would cover those up. Blot out my transgressions. And he needed to be blotted out because, you see, he had wives in spades. The most beautiful women in all of Israel was his beck and call. If he seen a guy walking down the street that he wanted, he was sovereign. He just said, man, I'd like to have her for a wife. It didn't matter what she thought, she came in. But here's a guy, Uriah, that's fighting a war for his supreme commander who is David. The, the guy is fighting a war that he should have been there supervising. The Bible said the king's supposed to go to war. And he's cooling it up on the deck, and Bathsheba is taking a bath. Now, ladies, I don't mean to get too descriptive here, but I'm pretty sure if there's a condo next door, and there's a deck up there, and there's guys up there uh, flying kites, and you've got a nine-foot-wide sliding glass door, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to pull a curtain Y'all with me? So, so neither one of them are totally innocent. But he looks and he lusts, and you know what happens. And he comes in, and they have an adulterous uh, liaison, and uh, she uh, becomes pregnant. And so she comes and tells David, um, I'm or sent to tell David, I'm going to have a baby. So, you know, Uriah wasn't a mathematician, but he could figure nine months. Y'all with me there? And so I, I remember this guy told me, he said, uh, he, he said, my daddy come home from the army and said, I was 11 months old. And he'd never seen me. I said, how long was he gone overseas? He said, about 10 months. <laughs> Anybody catch that besides me? But, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, he brings Uriah home and asks him how things going. Well, Uriah was just, you know, kind of like a sergeant or something. You think, why on earth did he not bring, you know, some of these big guys home? Why, why didn't he bring uh, one of these generals or colonels home? And he says, go on down to your house. Well, y'all know what he was hoping for. So he goes down to his house. He gets up the next morning. Guys come up and says, uh, hey, he said, your ride didn't go into his house last night. He slept on the porch. And he brought him up and he said, look, I, you're here for R&R. I want you to spend a little time, uh, you know, a little conjugal visit with your wife there. And he said, not so, my Lord, for my brothers are on the battlefield fighting. And I'm not going to come here and enjoy the pleasures of, of marriage while they're out there doing that. It's not going to happen. So he gets him drunk. Did y'all get that? The king gets him drunk. Now, I'm pretty sure Uriah begin to smell a rat about now. And he does the same thing. 
And then the cruelest thing, it's hard to believe this is David the shepherd boy. It's hard to believe that this is the guy that God said was the apple of his eye. It's hard to believe that this is a guy that said he was after God's own heart. It's hard to believe this same guy that wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that all of us are capable of some things that we're not proud of. And all of us at some time or another have probably done things we are not proud of. Uh, yours truly included. My grandmother was one of the godless little women. She was four foot eleven. I always say this. My grandpa was six one. How many members my little grandma Humphrey? My little grandma Humphrey was four foot eleven, weighed about two hundred and twenty pounds. Guess whose jeans I got? <laughs> I go to these Humphrey family reunions, all these people walk around that town and they go, who's the guy with the big head and the short legs? I ain't one of us. <laughs> but my grandma, I never heard my grandma say a bad word, never seen my grandma in nothing but a dress, never heard my grandma say anything whatsoever. Here's what my grandma said. There's good in the worst of us. And there's bad in the best of us. How many agrees that would you say, man? And so David, this guy that was the shepherd, the one that, that's, that, that Jesus is going to sit on his throne someday, he sends a death warrant out and he tells his general, when the fighting gets the worst, I want you to take your rye right in the heat of battle and withdraw and leave him there. And so that's exactly what happens. And my heart always breaks, Jimmy, when I think of Uriah's last minute. His last few moments on earth. Can you imagine you're out there fighting for your country? I mean, you're trying to stop a hostile government, and, and it's hand-to-hand, it's -hand, guys. It is the most gross, horrible warfare that mankind has ever known. They, they had axes and spears and chains and these steel balls, and they're out there just floundering each other to death. And he looks around, and everybody's gone. Amen. And he was killed. And he said, go back and tell him we lost a battle and Uriah the Hittite was killed too. I'm not even going to get into the message. I'm just going to go with this. Is that all right? I'm joining us. Everybody should join us. Say amen. amen. Everybody ain't going to say nothing. But anyway, <laughs> we, we, uh, eight, they come back and he sends a, a sealed the way they seal letters back then, they put wax on the thing and then they'd take their signet and stick in that hot wax and the general sealed that and sent it back and Nobody was, it was for king's eyes only. He opens it up. And we've lost a lot of men. And Uriah was one of them. Yeah. We're going to let her mourn for about 30 days and then bring her over here and we'll help everybody thinks we have a premature child. So after her 30 days of mourning or whatever, he brought her into the castle and they had a little baby boy. And he got away with it. <laughs> he thought... Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth of the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth of the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life ever after. And the Bible said, let us not, not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we'll reap if we faint not. One way or the other, you reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow, but you reap in kind. So he's now guilty of adultery. He's guilty of lust. He's, up, he's guilty of conspiracy. And ultimately, he's guilty of murder. And he brings them in, and he, like I say, he's sovereign. He's the man. Who's going to bring a charge against the king? Well, I'm glad to tell you that every generation that you read about in the Bible, God always has a man. There's not all, you know, in, in this day and time, what we call preachers wouldn't make a pimple on my grandpa's nose. I mean, guys that don't have any backbone whatsoever just kind of go with the flow, stick their finger in the air and see which way the, the winds of, of uh, public opinion is blowing, and that's what I'm going to preach about. Guys, you can never grow with that. And I'm, I'm not picking at anybody. There's some great men of God around here, great preachers around here, but there's a lot of hirelings, a lot of charlatans that they're telling people wrong and not telling the truth. So Nathan comes in. He says, King, I want to tell you about what happened in our kingdom. And, and I think it's something that you need to know. Well, listen, 
Generally, somebody having a little dispute like, like over a sheep, that would never come to the king's table. Uh, but th there's no way. John, they just didn't do that. They had courts like we do. They had magistrates. They had senate. They had all kinds of things. It shouldn't have come before the king. So the king thinks this must be pretty big if Nathan's bringing it to me. Nathan was the priest. And Nathan said, there was a guy in your kingdom that had an unbelievable herd of, sh of sheep. I mean, he was blessed beyond measure. Filthy rich, didn't want for anything. He had a friend come from our town. And, and so they were going to slaughter a sheep and feed him. David's going, yeah, 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 well, what happened? Well, they, they go out, instead of slaughtering one of their sheep, David, he goes across in the other farm, and the guy's got one sheep. And he bottle fed it. I believe that's what the Bible said. Raise it on his lap, it says. This sheep was more than just sheep. This was his little old friend, you see. And he said the guy had somebody go get it. And they killed that sheep. They cut its throat. And they ate it. And that man had no sheep. And David said, as the Lord liveth, this man shall surely die. And he'll repay four times. David lost four youngins over this mess. Are y'all with me? Three that was grown, one that was seven days old. You're going to reap what you sow. And he looked at him. He said, David, you're the man. You the man. It's you. Don't you know David's heart just about sank? And he thought, oh, my God, what have I done? And he said, you shall not die because you said you were sorry. He repented. But he said, that little boy's going to die. Now, I don't want to get into all the doctrinal issues. that We're not talking about living under grace. That was in the Old Testament. But I do still see stuff like that coming. Like I say, you're reaping kind. And David wrote these words. Verse 2. I want you to look what else he said. Verse number 2. Psalms 51. I'm sorry. Verse number 2. I didn't give them any notes today, so I apologize for that. I've got it if you need it. Got it? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgression. And this last one, fellas, ladies, I know this from not, I don't know this just from the word. I know this theologically. I know this experientially. And I've seen it. My sin is ever before me. You ever done something, you know sooner or later it's going to catch up with you. You know that maybe nobody knows it now, but here's the problem, guys. The devil is such a liar. The Bible said the word devil comes from the Latin word diablos, where we get our word uh, liar, father of lies, the originator of lies. And when the devil tempts us, he never shows us the payday. He shows us the fun part. And so he says, nobody will ever know this but you, and that's it. Well, God knows it. Amen. And God, I know that y'all going to think this is awful. I even use this terminology. Don't you understand? God will rat you out every now and then. He has me. Y'all with me? Adrian Rogers, my hero, Bellevue Baptist Church, Memphis, Tennessee. I, I love that man. He's been gone for years, but I still listen to him every week preach. How many ever listened to Dr. Rogers beside me? Love the man. Got the best voice for a pastor I ever heard. And so Adrian says, whatever sin you cover, listen, God will uncover. And whatever sin you uncover, God will cover. Whatever sin you cover, and don't, don't, I think I'm so naive, and I think we're sitting in a church of we're all ready to fly away. Whatever sin you cover, God will eventually uncover. And sins that you uncover, say, God, I'm, I, I messed up, or if I've done Danny wrong, Danny, I'm so sorry, brother. I, you know, people always say, well, I'd go to Danny, but he'll get mad. Listen, once you go to somebody and try to make things right, it's on them then. 
You know, so, and sometimes you may shock a fire out of somebody. Now, if you've, now let, me, let me tell you, let's, let's, a, a restitution needn't be no wider than the offense. If you've looked at some guy's wife and lusted, I'd just keep that between me and good Lord and maybe talk to the pastor. Y'all with me? I wouldn't walk up and say, Brother Fred, don't you forgive me. I've had some pretty rough thoughts about your wife. Pay y'all! <laughs> That, that, that's not what I'm talking about here, okay? But I want you to look at this, and I'm going to try to come to close. David didn't just call it sin. He calls it four different names. He felt so horrible that he called it four different names. Verse 1, he said, blot out my transgression. Transgression means simply to step over God's boundary. Eve done it in the Garden of Eden. Remember, Korah done it when he tried to stand up to Moses. That means transit. Well, when did he transgress? When he didn't go to war and he got lazy and he looked on Bathsheba and lusted. Does this make any sense to anybody? And then he says, wash me thoroughly, verse 2, from mine iniquity. Iniquity means it's just altogether wrong. It's willful. You know what you're doing. When did he commit iniquity? When he set up this adulterous liaison with meeting, if you will, with Bathsheba. And then he said in verse 2, and cleanse me from my sin. Sin is to miss the mark, the standard. When did he sin? When he tried to hide what he had done. And then it really gets bad down in verse 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil, evil. Evil is clear-cut knowledge, willfully wrong against conscience. When did he do that? When he knowingly signed a death warrant and put it in the hand of Uriah. Man, you talk about a story. A man going to battle for his nation, his king, carrying his own death warrant in his hand. Folks, this is not just a fairy tale. This really, really happened. And you, you know, the Talmud and Jewish law and Jewish history, uh, this story has been told for 3,500 years now, 3,000 years, I guess. What a horrible, horrible, horrible story. And if it ended right here, it, we, we would preach this message as the greatest tragedy of the Old Testament. But it didn't end here. Because David showed what kind of character he had. Would you, would you bear with me just a minute in closing? Again, as I've said about three times through this sermon, David was sovereign. In those days, and Nathan would have been beheaded or drug out and killed, and then nobody knows but him and God and Bathsheba. But David didn't do that. David broke. My Lord, what have I done? What have I done? And then he pins, in my opinion, in this country preacher's humble opinion, I don't claim to be a scholar nor the son of one, but in my opinion, this is one of the most beautiful pieces of literature that David ever wrote. Psalms 23 is beautiful. Psalms 22 is incredible. But I want you to listen at the words that this man says. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop. That's a brush, and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. His depression, his anxiety, his guilt was so bad that when he laid down at bed at night, it felt like his arms and legs and everything about him. I, I've been there. You just lose your strength. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He knew there was nothing within himself could undo what he's done. When we realize that we have, even though we have got ourselves in messes, most of the time we're unavailable to get ourselves out. The first, it's like all these 12-step programs. Thing, the first thing you got to do is admit that you're wrong. Admit that you've got a problem. Admit that you just messed up. One Sunday, I'll never forget it, years ago, that's before we had all these churches come out of here. We were packed. There's probably 400 people here, 350. And I had this message. I just knew it's 20 years ago. I was a little younger and more stupid than I am now. 
And I had this message. I just knew that it was just going to move everybody, that everybody was going to move. And I preached this message and gave an invitation, and nobody moved. And I'm going to tell you how, embar how I'm embarrassed to even tell you this, how stupid that I can be. And I said, well, it is certainly glad to, I'm really glad to pastor Perfect Church. John, you and Glenda was coming here now. I know you remember that wonderful statement I made. I said, it sure is good to pastor a perfect church. And I pouted like a little baby and left. I didn't make it to, it wasn't Giovanni's then until God said, you owe that church an apology. And I said, what? <laughs> between me and you. My bad, my bad. And God said, no. You made a public butt out of yourself. And I said, but God, he said, I'm teaching you a lesson. You obey me. Well, did you actually hear the, the verbiage of the verbal? No, I didn't, but I heard it in my spirit, John. And so I come up with this idea, well, we, let's say we had 350 Sunday morning. We probably ain't going to have 150 Sunday night. I'll just do it Sunday night. And God said, nope. Nope. And so the next Sunday morning, my heart felt like it was going to jump out of my chest. Nobody else knew what was going on but me. Oh, I could see a few insulted faces said, there's our perfect preacher. <laughs> and I said, turn your Bibles to wherever it was. And God said, if you want to preach this on your own, have at it. And I said, I'd like to apologize to the church. And David's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life because I, I value my integrity. I, I value confidence that people put in me. I value walking and, and being real and not being a hypocrite, but I value trying to be the same at the ballpark that I am at the church. I value that. And, and to show a chink in my armor, God, what will they think? And I said, I was arrogant last week. I talked down to you, and I promised this church when I took it years ago that I would never talk down to you. And for that, I'm genuinely sorry. Sandy Laws was sitting right here, and she started. And directly, everybody was cheering, and they all stood up. And as they stood, it felt like the weight of the world had been lifted off my shoulders. Because that thing had been eating me all week. That thing that the devil told me, boy, they'll have no respect for you after you do that. People realize you're full of faults and failures just like them. You got to rise above that. Matter of fact, a military guy here told me, never let them see a chink in your armor. That's all right if you're a drill sergeant. That don't work as a pastor. Ronnie, you know what I'm talking about. Me and you talked about it several times and so I went on and preached my message it wasn't much of a message and I gave the invitation Ronnie if you'll remember this altar was packed people were making not only peace with God but there were some people had some conflicts with each other that I wasn't even aware of and they were and person after person come up and said pastor your confession of your weakness in front of this, cloud, this crowd freed me to admit that I messed up. David said, create a clean heart of me, O Lord. And then Robbie, the greatest news of all, he said, then will I teach sinners thy way. Then will I be a witness for you. Then will I show the love of God, the peace that passes all understanding. I shared with you, and my mama used to cringe. When I was 16 years old, me and a bunch of my fellow idiots decided that we would invest in the street narcotics business. The, the kind that smokes and burns up. We resulted in being put in jail as minors, and I pleaded guilty, 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 guilty. And I'll never forget, when my dad bailed me out, 
my dad, when he got mad, didn't say anything. He didn't say nothing. And my daddy had one of those looks in his eyes like if it wasn't against the law, you'd be dead, boy. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And we talking about the chairman of the deacon board. We talking about Brother Run. How many here knew my daddy? Raise your hand. And I'm not trying to prompt you. How many think he's one of the finest men you ever met in your life? You ought to have been, you ought to have been your daddy. <laughs> And my daddy gave me that crazy look out of his eye. And my heart was down in my toenails, man. And I, you talk about having a revival. Oh, God, if you won't let him kill me, I promise I'll never smoke another day. Oh, Lord, please help me, Jesus. Oh, God, help me. You ever notice when we get in trouble, God's first name's O? Oh, God. <laughs> and Mama took one of them old black pocketbooks ladies from the 60s and 70s and had them big brass balls that, cr that crossed up there. <laughs> and we were on the third floor. If the jail had been on the fourth floor, I wouldn't be here today. And I, what are you going to say? Don't hit me, Mama, because Dad would say, you want me to. <laughs> so all the way down the steps we go. I'm scared to death. I sit in the back seat, and it was almost like, Officers Humphrey have arrested one. They got him in the back. They're taking him to, to put the sentence forward now. But to my surprise, my daddy talked to me. Yeah. Eddie Van Hoy is the only person in this room that knows what my daddy said to me. I confessed it to Eddie years ago playing golf. You remember Eddie? Eddie said, son, I want to apologize to you. I said, for what? He said, for not doing a better job showing you the love of God and how to be a man. Robbie, I wished that he had broke a chair over my head, and my daddy never done that. But I've, that is the lowest moment of my entire life. And I said, you ain't going to whoop me? And he said, son, I've been whooped so bad over this. I, don't, I, I want the Lord to take care of that. All of this hell was breaking out in our house. My grandpa was an old Baptist preacher. Y'all that know him, my grandpa couldn't whisper in the Grand Canyon. Grandpa had a voice like that he couldn't hear. And hey, boy! And he was a big man. He was intimidating, Grandpa White was. Every kid in three blocks of his neighborhood was scared of him. I walked in, he said, what's wrong with you, boy? And Daddy gave Papa a look, and he didn't hit me no more either. <laughs> and I went in there and sat down. And I can tell you at 16 years old that this is the first time I really, really experienced mercy and grace. And I want to show you what happened to me that day. That next morning, nobody talked to me. Sandra, do you remember it? <laughs> she was a good girl, never got no trouble. <laughs> Sandra was a great kid. Sandra Fire is one of the finest human beings I've ever known, period. Yeah. That's my oldest sister for the old. Teresa, or Sandra, stand up so people quit getting you mixed up with the piano player. Stand up. That's Sandra. Sandra has literally, this is the truth. I've seen Sandra go back and go, God bless you. Teresa beating the hides off the piano and it'd say, I love to hear you play that piano. Mikey, sit down in this chair, please. M Mama fixed breakfast. I didn't get home before 5.30 that morning. Mama fixed breakfast. She never spoke to me. Daddy never said a word. Grandpa was growling. They'd come over from North Carolina and was stay all night with us. And my grandma, Bessie. How many of y'all knew Bessie? Little old Bessie slipped in. Here's what she done, guys. I can't wait to get to heaven and tell her I appreciate it. She came up behind me. My little old grandma was illiterate. She could never read or write. She, she was raised in the, uh, the mining communities up in Emerville. Godless little woman I ever knew. And she came up and said, she always called me Don. She never called me Donnie. I have no idea why. Everybody else did. But she leaned over and said, Don. And I thought, Lord, Grandma was going to fuss at me. I said, what, Grandma? She said, I ain't proud of what you done. <laughs> <sighs> 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 
but I sure enough love you. I thought I was cool. I was a tough guy. He beat my brains out and I wouldn't cry. But I could fear tears running down because in that little woman's gentle touch yeah. and in her gentle voice, she'd done what no court could do to me. She'd done to what no fear could do to me. She'd done to what no jail could do to me. She showed me unconditional love. I'm not proud of what you've done, but I sure enough love you. Amen. That has been 55 years, 50 years, and I still can feel her warm breath on my neck. At her funeral, I shared that with her six young'uns. My Aunt Ruth from Alaska come up and said, I could hear Mama say that. My mother said, that sounded just like Mama. Charles White said, she had never said that to me, but she said stuff similar to that. My Uncle Paul said, that's Mama. You're here today, you can be seated. You say, Pastor, I've messed up, you can be seated. My Pastor, I've messed up. Is God mad at me, strangely enough? No. No, he's not. No, he's not. I've heard this stuff browbeat into people about... And I know God's a God of wrath. I'm not an idiot. I understand his word. And I understand if we are not saved that we, we're going to eternal doom. There's no doubt in my mind. But God has never poured his wrath out on his children. God loves his youngins. The, of all the rearing I did in my children, one thing I regret the worst was Shanna, my daughter at Sing Sung up here today, this most athletic girl that I ever seen when she was an all-star cheerleader. And I remember she wanted to go take ballet lessons. And at that time I was with the independent Baptist boys and I tell you rather Donnie a praying knee and a dancing foot don't go on the same leg. And I hate to go to dance recitals with my granddaughter now because every time I sit there, I think, what a sorry daddy, why I didn't let my daughter do that. And what's silly, we thought that was some kind of simple, that we let her be a cheerleader. <laughs> and she's over at ETSU at a basketball game, and they come out on the floor to cheer, and I'm up there, and my daughter turns around and goes, <clears throat> And all these boys go, woo! All these calls go, yeah, baby! And my wife's going, ain't she talented? I said, talented? I wouldn't let her ballet, and she's a go-go dancer. <laughs> I don't know how you just, they just, she, oh, by the way, we got an all-American cheerleader here today. Would you stand up, please? God bless your heart. Give her a hand. But once you get into college and high school, it ain't cheering no more. It's soft porn. <laughs> and I still regret that. But I've told her a hundred times that I love her. Shannon, if you want to take ballet lessons now, I'll pay for them. <laughs> I'll buy you a tutu and some of them little squares. Huh? I'll pay for Jenny's to make up for what I don't need. People ask me all the time, Brother Donnie, why do you go on so much foolishness? Because that's who I am. I don't think of this stuff. It just comes to me. The Bible said, Mary heart doeth well like a medicine. And some of y'all need some medicine. <laughs> Let's stand our feet and close our eyes, please.